Today, we look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 through 15, as we continue our sermon series entitled God's Design. God is the sovereign creator. Four weeks ago, when we opened up this series, we established that God is the sovereign creator, which makes him the sovereign designer, that he has a particular design for the world and everything in it. Four weeks ago, we established the doctrine of creation as the chief design for the world and for humanity. Three weeks ago, we looked at God's design for human purpose and what is referred to as the cultural mandate. Last week, we talked about God's design for gender and sexuality, and I pray that every week you are seeing a reoccurring theme, that when we live according to God's design, We see human flourishing. We see what the Bible calls shalom. But when we live against God's design or contrary to God's design, in any category we establish, we can only expect chaos. We need to be a people that are reoriented to God's design for the heavens and the earth, for God's design for humanity and everything in it. Today, we look at God's design for work as we establish the biblical doctrine of vocation. We do so by looking at Genesis chapter 2, verse 5 through 15. This is the word of the Lord. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground... And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. The Lord God planted a garden of Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold and the gold of that land is good. But Beledium and Onyx stone are there and the name of the second river is the Gishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The grass withers and the flower fades, but no, not the word of our Lord. It stands forever. Amen. You may be seated. If you were to receive $10 million tomorrow morning, would you quit your job? Be honest. If you were to receive $10 million tomorrow, would you quit your job? The problem is most of us view work and our vocation according to the patterns of this world. And so naturally, If we live according to the patterns of this world and we view our work according to the worldview of society, then every single one of you should quit your job, by all means, if you were to receive $10 million tomorrow morning. But I want to ask you a question. Is the world still broken? Does the world still need to be restored? If the answer to those two questions is yes, then we work until our last dying breath. You see, we need to, in the North American church, we need a, to recapture the vision of what it means to work unto the Lord. We need to have a biblical doctrine of vocation established in Genesis 2, recaptured at the Reformation, That biblical doctrine of work and vocation is desperately needed in order for us to function as the people of God, 
that we have been called to be in the world for the world. I get excited, as excited talking about this topic maybe than any other topic. Because without it, life is boring. Without it, our work is meaningless. Without it, our work is robbed of the dignity and the sacredness that God has established us to have in the garden. And so for a few moments today, let's pursue this together as we recapture as a church God's design for work and for our vocation. I want to look at three things briefly this morning. I want us to look at, one, the sacredness of our work. Two, the problem with our work. If it's so sacred, why is it so hard? And three, the hope for our work. The sacredness of our work, the problem with our work, and third, the hope for our work. We established a few weeks ago that humanity was created in the image of God. And in the opening pages of scripture in Genesis 1 and 2, we find a God who is at work. The very first verse of scripture tells us that God worked by creating the heavens and the earth. And if we're created in his image, if God works, he expects his people, his image bearers to work as well. God is working and creating and designing and making. In the passage we read today, God is likened to a gardener who gets his hands dirty by putting his hands in the soil, in the dust to create humanity. It is a God in Genesis 1 and 2 who is at work. But then in verse 5 of chapter 2, it says, but there's no man to work the ground. God works and he's created us in his image to work as well in his creation. And the reason this is important to establish in Genesis 1 and 2 is because we need to understand that work is not a result of the fall. Work is not introduced to humanity after Genesis 3, the fall, but it's introduced to humanity prior to the fall. Work is not a result or a punishment of sin, but instead it is given to humanity as a gift, something to be enjoyed. Where were Adam and Eve created into? A garden that is likened to paradise. And it would be in paradise they would be working. It means paradise is not a beach in Tahiti drinking frozen drinks. But paradise... It's like a garden where we work in our father's business. That is what true paradise is. A God who is at work from the beginning, creating and making. And then in chapter 2 in verse 15, after he creates man, he says, I put man in the garden to do what? To work it and to keep it. Two significant words in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 15. If you have your Bibles and a pen, underline the word, work it and keep it. The word work translated in the Hebrew is avadah, which means to worship. In our English, we have two separate words for work and worship. In the Hebrew, they had one because they understood the people of God created in the image of God understood the seamless integration of work and worship. The people of God never disconnected what they do on Sunday morning to what they were called to do on Monday morning. Seamless integration. When they worked and when they served, they were doing it unto the Lord. To work it meant to worship. It means that their work was sacred and full of dignity. The word keep it that phrase in the Hebrew is shemar, which means to guard and protect. And what's significant about the phrase, work it and keep it, is that this phrase was used to describe the work of the priest in the tabernacle and the temple. It's to communicate to all human beings that are created in the image of God that you have been created to be a priesthood, a holy nation, a royal priesthood 
that your work is full of dignity and value and sacredness, that there is no such thing as this secular sacred divide that only the men that are preaching up in the pulpit or administering the sacrament of baptism have sacred work. But if you have been created in the image of God, you have been called to work and work unto the Lord in the Father's business. It's why 1 Peter 2 verse 9 reads this, Those that have been recreated in Christ, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness. It means that if you are in your 20s or you are in the stage of life that our society unfortunately calls retired, that you, as an image bearer of the Most High God, are a priest in the royal kingdom of Yahweh, a priesthood, a holy nation that go from this sanctuary every Sunday, bringing the light of the gospel and the light of the kingdom, regardless of where he's called you and regardless of what he has called you to do. This is what makes the Judeo-Christian worldview so distinct. We certainly didn't get this from the Greeks. Greek philosophy taught that work was for the slaves. The Greeks taught that work was for those that are of lowly estate, that work was meaningless, that the whole goal of life was to escape from work. It's where we get the idea of retirement from. The medieval church didn't do any better. The medieval church thought that culture was on top of culture, uh, that the church was on top and over culture. And they're the ones that created the unhealthy divide between the sacred and the secular that that the clergy or the priesthood alone, the paid professional clergy alone did sacred work and you all do the meaningless secular work Monday through Friday. It wasn't until the Protestant Reformation and we had the recovery of what is known as the priesthood of all believers, men like Martin Luther and John Calvin that restored the idea that everybody that calls upon the name of Jesus Christ is called as a priest, a royal priest in God's royal temple. If creation is the royal temple of God, then we are all called as a priesthood to go out to be ambassadors and vice regents on behalf of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The doctrine of vocation that came out of the Reformation was an awakening to the sleeping giant of the church. Once every Christian discovered that they could be used by God in their sphere of influence, no matter where God placed them to be used for his kingdom, Christianity spread like wildfire and turned this world upside down. And if we want to see revival that leads to reformation in the 21st century, particularly here in North America, We need to embrace the calling, the calling that God has placed on our life, whether you're 20 or whether you're 80, whether you're paid or you're unpaid, regardless of what profession God has called you to, you have been employed in the Father's business. Your work is sacred. But if work is so good, as it's defined by God in Genesis chapter 2, why in the world is it so hard? Well, one chapter later tells us, the problem with our work. In Genesis 3, 17, in light of the fall and the sin of humanity, we are told these are the consequences. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles, It shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, and you are dust, and dust you shall return. Because of the fall, and because we have lived according, not to God's design, but our design, because we desired to openly rebel against God in Genesis chapter 3, Instead of working over creation, creation is now working over us. 
Instead of subduing creation and having dominion over us, it now subdues and has dominion over us. Instead of us shaping culture, culture is shaping us. Instead of subduing and having dominion over the serpent, the serpent and the beast of the field have dominion over us. It's interesting that one verse earlier in, in verse 16, it says that the curse of the woman would be the labor of childbearing, the pain of childbearing. Do you know that the pain, the word pain in verse 16 is the, fir- is the same word as pain used in verse 17, meaning that God is telling us that our work in creation is like giving birth to a baby. The pain of childbearing is the same work that will come, the same pain that will come from the work that is required to toil the ground and to toil creation. Creation is fighting against us. And because of sin, we have turned the goodness of creation and the goodness of work into an idol. And instead of worshiping the creator, we worship creation. Instead of worshiping the one that has given us good work to do, we worship the work itself. We are an idol-making factory because of sin. And instead of our identity being in the God that created us, we find our identity in our work. That's why we're so exhausted by it because we have taken something that is good and sacred and turned it into something that is worshiped. We find our identity not in the goodness of God, but we find our identity in what we do. It's the reason we work too hard. It is the reason that we work for the wrong reasons and for the wrong motives. It's the reason we don't find our worth and value in God, but instead we find our worth and our value in what we do. If we're honest with ourselves because of sin, we hit the ground running every single day in attempts to justify our own existence. And we use our work, something that is good and sacred, to cover our shame, to cover our insecurities. We can't even vacation well. Whoever has admitted at one point that you come out of vacation saying this, I need a vacation from my, we don't even know how to relax well. (laughs) Because even on vacation, the restlessness of our souls is running a hundred miles an hour, justifying ourselves, proving our worth, Proving our own validation, validating ourselves to this world. Oh, we are great at being idolaters and turning something that is good and sacred into something that will absolutely crush us in order to make a name for ourselves, in order to justify who we are. So is there any hope? Is there any hope of taking something that is broken something that we have destroyed because of sin. Well, third and lastly, there is hope. The hope for our work. The hope for our work is found very simply in the work of Jesus Christ. We find hope for our work in the work of Jesus Christ because in that same chapter of Genesis chapter 3, we are given a glimpse of a promise. In verse 15, We are told that the seed of the woman one day will come and crush the head of the serpent. We are told that another priest would come, a royal seed would come from a royal line, and it would be through his work, his work that would come through the person of Jesus Christ. And on the basis of his work on our behalf, we could find our identity in him and in him alone. It would be through the finished work of Jesus Christ, a great and better priest that would have dominion and subdue the serpent on the cross once and for all, that would give him the right to alone declare that the work is finished. So therefore, we could live in light of the good news that no longer do I have to prove myself by my work, 
because Jesus has proven himself through his work for us on the cross. Instead of being a slave to our work, trying to justify our existence, we can look to the finished work of Jesus Christ and be justified and validated that we can have worth and value not on the basis of what we do or what we fail to do, but on the basis of our true royal priest, Jesus Christ. We find our identity in Christ and in Christ alone. So if this is true, amen. That Jesus has come and he has come as the priest who do not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead took the form of a servant, laying down his life. This good news is the good news that is preached here every single Sunday because it is only through that good news that we could ever be. Idolatrous people like us could ever be freed to actually work with a spirit of joy that we could actually see our work and service not for our glory, but for the glory of God. And if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, the true and better priest who came to accomplish the work that you could never accomplish, I plead with you to surrender your life to him this morning. Be freed from self-justification. Be freed from self-validation and work and serve the King of kings and Lord of lords with a spirit of endless joy for his kingdom now and forevermore. So what's the call to action? If it is true that our work is sacred, what does this mean for us tomorrow morning? First, first takeaway, it means that we need to restore dignity to our work. We need to enter into our work tomorrow morning with a sense of sacred duty a sacred calling. We need to ask the question, regardless of your sphere of influence, regardless of what God has called you to, whether it's paid or unpaid, whether you're employed by a business or it's volunteer work, you need to ask the question, how is my work bringing about redemption to a broken and lost world? I once heard a CEO say, in an industry where everybody is concerned with the bottom line, I'm concerned with the redemptive bottom line. How is my work and my affluence and my influence bringing redemption to the darkness of creation? We need to restore dignity and sacredness to our work. Second thing we need to do, we need to redefine retirement. It's not in the Bible. We might retire from certain tasks. We might retire from getting a paycheck. But I've got news for you. We will work in the new creation. We will have jobs and it will not be under the burden of sin, but we will work and we will serve with utter joy because we will finally be freed from the presence of sin. And so until you take your last dying breath, I don't care whether you're paid or unpaid, find a way to serve, mentor, lead, volunteer. Could you imagine what Western civilization would look like if everybody just one day quit and retired? It has always been the church working endlessly to their last dying breath. Lawyers and executives, managers, volunteers, nonprofit leaders, builders, politicians, doctors, teachers, stay-at-home moms, civic leaders, all working to extend God's kingdom on earth that is as it is in heaven. This is our calling and we will do it with joy forever. It means third, that we've got to work with a God-centered excellence. If it is true that God has called each one of you to work unto the Lord, we have to be the very best at what we've been called to do. We have to do it with a, with a sense of excellence that what we produce and how we treat our employees and how we serve our community is done with God-centered excellence for his glory. And then fourth and last, we need to work with integrity. If we are called to integrate our faith with everything we do, 
We cannot be known as men and women who cut corners. We need to be known as men and women of the highest integrity, looking for darkness in our workplace, looking for darkness in our industry, and bringing light to where there's injustice, bringing light to where there is darkness. That is our calling as the people of God, whether you're 20 or whether you're 80. Lastly, a word to students. If you're a middle school student or a high school student or a college student, listen to me carefully. Missions and ministry is not for an exclusive club that belongs only to pastors. I want you to go to college and pursue an industry where you can use your gifts and talents for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We are desperate for men and women who will bear the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of this world. Dorothy Sayers, British author, said something phenomenal happened at the end of World War II as the Allied soldiers were coming back from World War II. They were disillusioned, many of them. They had seen countless deaths. Some were coming back maimed and injured, losing loved ones and friends, coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder. But the one thing that was remarkable about the Allied soldiers as they returned home is they came back with a sense of pride and joy that spread throughout the entire Western world. And she says, how in the world could men that have just gone through that have so much pride and joy? She concluded the answer is simple, because they had spent their lives ridding the world of evil. Brothers and sisters, If you are called a Christian this morning, it is your calling to rid the world of evil. As a holy nation, as a kingdom of priests, to go out and trample the head of the serpent. And where there is evil, you bring the goodness of the kingdom. Where there is darkness, you bring light. Because you embrace the audacious privilege that we have to co-labor with Jesus in his kingdom and every day be employed in the Father's business. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, what a gift to be called a holy nation, a royal priesthood called into the service of God regardless of our stage of life, regardless of our industry, regardless of our gifts and talents employed into the family business, to allow the light of the gospel to shine in all that's fair. May you wake us up. Wake us up to the glory of the kingdom and the sacredness of our calling. Lord, I pray that we would find our identity not in what we do, but we would find our identity in what Christ has done for us. We would not find our identity in our work, but we would find our identity in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and that would free us to no longer justify ourselves, but to live in light of the great promise that we have been justified by the one that matters, Jesus the Christ. Empower us by the power of your Holy Spirit equipped with the word of God, which is truth, to go out as a kingdom of priests, working and keeping this created order, the kingdom of God, on behalf of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Empower the church to be the priesthood of all believers, ridding the world of evil and darkness for the kingdom of light, for the King of kings, and Lord of lords. And in Christ's name I pray this prayer. Amen.